So now we are moving on to the next speaker uh, with Dr. Marnaz Arvane. So she's a, a lecturer at the University of Sheffield in the UK and the director of the Physiological Signals and Systems Laboratory. So she has been working on uh, brain computer interfaces uh, for many years now. Actually, I got the chance to meet her back in 2009 when we were both working together in Singapore at the Institute for Infogram Research on brain computer interfaces. And so she has explored many aspects of BCI in their design, the signal processing, the machine learning, and the application to both uh, healthy users and clinical populations. And so today we are looking forward to uh, hearing about uh, our latest research. Thank you so much, uh, Fabienne, for the introduction. So let me share my slides. And, uh, okay, so, and if I move everything around, perfect. So, yeah, thank you so much, Fabienne. It's my pleasure to be here today with you all. And uh, my talk today is about implicit brain machine interactions in navigation and target identification tasks. So as many of you are familiar with BCI brain computer interface, yeah. this technology uses brain signals as a mean to control an external device, control a computer. And you can see this is the components of a traditional BCI, uh, which uh, uses brain signals, apply some pre-processing algorithms, and these brain signals are used to control an external device like an assistive device. So the main ambition of BCI is helping people who are severely disabled to have a control over the environment and gain some sorts of independence. There are a number of flaws with existing BCIs that Fabian has mentioned, also Stephen, and one of them is low level, the requirement for low level action control. So for example, if uh, I want to control a prosthetic hand using a very standard state of the art motor imagery BCI, I need to imagine, okay, I move my hand right, 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 thereafter left, left. Now, for example, for grasping, I need to imagine another type of body movement. So it's the information transfer rate is very slow in this system. And of course, it has a very high mental workload because all these activities, mental activities, all these small, small steps needs to uh, be controlled by the user. But in a real application, for example, if I want to grasp a cup of coffee, I just see the cup and I send the abstract information to my mind and I just grasp the, the cup of coffee. I don't think that, okay, first I need to contract this muscle, thereafter I need to move the other muscle, thereafter I need to change the direction of my elbow. No, everything automatically will be done. Just I send abstract information to my brain. So our aim is to investigate if we can have such a sort of semi-autonomous BCI that uh, we can pass the burden of all these low level decisions to the system and human can give a type of high level control to the system. So this is our aim and looking at literature and also uh, the discussion, the previous talk that uh, Prof Zander presented, it shows that the current in literature, there are some passive BCI that they try to alleviate this burden. So for example, they looked at the embedded uh, error-related potential, our brain reaction, the spontaneously generated brain response to errors, when they, they perceive, when we observe an error, for example, made by machine, and they use this system, they can embed this into the system to, uh, to control a robot. For example, this work may, uh, done by uh, Milan's group, in 2015, they show that the user just observed uh, the robot is moving over different objects. And uh, if the robot is moving toward the object correctly, okay, they detect the EEG, the BCI system detects that this action is correct. If the, movement, if the robot moves in another direction, in a wrong direction, error-related potential, our brain response to error is detected and the robot understands that 
okay, this is a wrong action. So the robot can uh, improve the action. So they embedded this system with a type of reinforcement learning, taking into account the previous uh, decisions of the uh, user and they try to find a quasi the optimum strategy to reach to the target uh, in a type of semi autonomous way. If I want to make this uh, method, make this strategy a bit clearer, uh, let me give you uh, a type of real world example. So, assume okay, we have a user on wheelchair with BCI, and the user is in a type of building, a university building, for example, and this user wants to go to a lecture theater. Based on the previous uh, you know, experiences, the system knows that mostly the user goes to lecture theater seven. So the first action, the wheelchair, automatically moves towards the left. But the brain signals, when the uh, BCI system checks the brain signals, it realized that no, an error-related potential happens. So it was an error action. So the system corrects and decides that, OK, this direction, the left direction was wrong. So these lecture theater one, seven, six is out of the option. And it moves and it look at the other possibilities, lecture theater two, three, four, five, based on the previous uh, decisions pre uh, of the user, lecture theater four now has the highest probability to be chosen. So this is how we can embed a type of BCI with a sort of uh, probability-based model. So this probability-based model is our user model, which uh, can be based on the previous actions of the user. And as uh, previous speakers mentioned, it can also include a lot of other things like the, uh, the emotions of the user, the mental states, and many things like this. And we have a type of BCI system that can tell us, OK, if the decision made is correct or wrong. In this research that uh, has been conducted by uh, my PhD students, um, we started thinking, OK, can we have a type of implicit control in a greater detail? What we have now is error or not error. But can we extract more information? Can our BCI system extract more information from these spontaneously generated brain signals? Can we, for example, understand if it is an error, what type of error is it? If it is a correct action, what type of correct action is it? So let me again give you an example of the experiment that we did. Uh, we, did. we have a type of simulated robot, and we have a target. Of course, only the user knows which uh, ball is the target. Okay, here just for the demonstration, I put it blue. So the user wants the robot to grasp a target ball, but the robot doesn't know what is this. The robot starts moving based either randomly or based on the previous choices of the user, and the robot moves toward left direction. So this is our error, and we call it as error type one, moving away from the target. Thereafter, this is a correct action. We call it correct action type one, moving towards the target. We have this correct action, which is reaching the target. So this reaching target might be different. We may, our brain may react different to the another action that is just moving toward the uh, tar uh, target, but still our robot is very far from the target. Error, we can have moving farther away from the target, but also we can have this type of error, stepping off the target instead of the grasping. So we were wondering if our brain responds differently to these types of errors. Of course, we can have this, uh, reaching the target and grasping. So we performed such an experiment. Our users only observed the task and we collected the brain signals. We tried to see if there are any differences between error movements, moving, moving further away from the target and stepping off the target, and correct movements, getting closer to the target and reaching the target. So let's first of all look at the uh, brand average error-related potentials. 
here you can see in CZ, we conducted two tasks. One task here is the navigation task, the uh, uh, virtual uh, robotic hand that I showed you. We also observed, uh, we also collected data from a type of uh, cognitive task that uh, the user uh, performed, make some decisions. So these decisions might be erroneous or correct, but there were two types of different errors. So as you can see, we have a source of error related potential, but for these two, the amplitude of PE late positivity was different between these two top types of error. Here in the navigation task especially, if we observe that PE was larger when the robot steps off the target, but the amplitude was slightly but significantly uh, shorter when we have when the robot goes further away from the target. And it somehow makes sense because in literature, in neuroscience studies, we know that the amplitude of PE somehow shows us uh, it's context related. It shows how, how we interpret this error. Uh, and it shows somehow uh, expectation, confidence about the error, or even importance of error. So uh, for us, if the robot is already very far from the target and is just getting again farther from the target, it may not be that much uh, taking our attention compared to the time that say, okay, the robot is up just on top of the target. It needs to grab it, but the robot just a step off from that. So we applied, we tried to see if it is feasible to distinguish between these two types of error. Uh, so it is completely feasibility study. We apply the state of the art algorithm that we use for detecting error versus correct. So we band pass data from one to 10 Hertz. We, uh, of course, we oversampled our classes and we used a stepwise LDA uh, to, uh, to select the best time interval, EEG amplitudes across different channels and across eight channels. This, this type of classification is more challenging than classification between error versus correct. First of all, these two signals are very close to each other. EEG is very noisy and having such signals very close, it makes it more challenging to distinguish them. The, the, the other thing is that these are errors and usually we, we don't have a lot of errors in a task. So our training data was very small and we had imbalance condition. The error of stepping off the target, we had much smaller samples compared to the time that we had error moving away from the target. But anyways, as a first attempt, a type of feasibility study, we observed that we could achieve accuracy above chance level. In some of the subjects, we could achieve accuracy up to 80% distinguishing between these two errors. And for the first uh, experiment, 18 out of 25 participants, we got uh, classification accuracy above chance level. And for the second experiment, we got 10 out of 14 participants accuracy in distinguishing two types of errors above chance level. The second part, we looked at uh, our two correct actions moving towards target versus reaching target. And as you can see, again, they are slightly different, but these uh, difference in P300 was significant. So the, the, the main difference in grand average was focused on the P300. And it makes sense as, uh, again, because in neuroscience studies, we know that the amplitude of P300 is somehow related to our expectation from the task, uh, the probability of having seen that action and the importance of that action for us. And as you can see, uh, when the target is reached, we have a higher P300 amplitude compared to the time that still the robot is far from the target, but it's moving toward the target. Here, we applied the same classification strategy to classify between these two types of errors. We applied on two different tasks. Both of them were navigation tasks, but usually they were slightly different. We got accuracy above chance level for all our participants. And as you can see, we got some of our participants achieved accuracy above 80%, uh, which was promising. 
Now, at this stage, we started to say, okay, let's embed these uh, types of four-way classification EEG feedback to our user model. Our user model was a type of Bayesian model, a type of probability model based on the previous action. Okay, what are the probability of different uh, uh, points, different locations to be a target? We use a type of variable astring uh, astringency, a type of threshold, to see how conservative our model should be, how much evidence our model requires in order to identify a look at an object as a target. We, we chose different levels, for example, 50% probability up to 95% probability being a more conservative, conservative or a less conservative system. So uh, the robot makes some actions, the user observe these actions and has some sort of interpretation from this action. So this interpretation is, okay, it was a correct one. It was incorrect one. What type of correct was that? Our classifier makes a type of detection about, okay, what is the interpretation of the user? So this is our observation. And of course, this observation is not 100% reliable. Based on the accuracy that, that we achieved, we said to the system, okay, based on a source of probability, you need to rely on this system. We got this likelihood mat mat uh, matrix based on the training data that we had. For example, if the system says target reached, how much you need to consider it that is the correct one, how much you need to say, okay, it is another action. And using these things based on each action of the robot, the probability of different uh, locations to be a target was updated. And of course, it, we repeat these tasks until we reach to the point that has a probability of being target above a threshold. And at that case, the system chooses that point as a as a target. So it's a combination between a type of Bayesian model and uh, a detailed BCI classifier, which is based on the brain signals that are generated merely by observing the task. So the user only observes the task, the user doesn't, uh, you know, consciously, actively generate any brain activity. So we, uh, try to uh, reuse uh, our EEG data. We used some sort of uh, real EEG data in a simulated environment to see how good this system could be. So we had one part, okay, robot is only randomly moving around. The other part is that, okay, the robot is using our the EEG signal as a feedback, but there is no Bayesian, but there is no user model. And the other one, we have two uh, EEG implicit control, BCI feedback plus the user model, but with a different level of uh, astringency. And as you can see, in terms of accuracy, our proposed models improved, uh, they, they got significantly better performance in terms of uh, identifying the targets, which uh, it can achieve up to 100% if you have a type of high uh, astringency. In terms of the speed, uh, again, uh, if, if the astringency level is uh, low, the speed is good, but if we increase the astringency level, the system is getting very conservative. So the same goes around until gathers more information, so the system is a bit slower than um, our proposed method with astringency of uh, 0.1. We also compared our method with, uh, okay, with the previous method, which they use only error versus not error, type of binary classifier. And also we increased our searching environment instead of a type of one dimension, one times nine, with a two dimension, 20 times 20. The previous studies, they mentioned that when we increase the scale of the system, uh, the, system is, they, they, the system failed to work as good as it used to uh, do. But here you can see that still 
although even we increase the system to 20 times 20, the red part, still the system works very good, reliable, a big uh, percentage of the targets could be identified, and it was much faster than previously binary-based uh, system uh, that we achieved. So these are very proof of concept study. Of course, there are a lot to improve. We need to further improve our BCR model to improve the accuracy. Now our system is having the accuracy to something around 67, 68% uh, in detecting these different types of errors and corrects. Of course, for example, one of the ways to improve this is um, gathering more data or doing transfer learning. The problem that we have our trained data is very small. So if we can do transfer learning or use other approaches, if we can improve our BCR model, the implicit control can be also improved. It's interesting to overcome challenges of a human in the loop scenario. Uh, in a couple of examples that we had, when we in our case, uh, compared to the previous studies, our users, they know that they are controlling the device, they're controlling the navigation robot. So they got sometimes overexcited or over disappointed when they realized that ro uh, robot makes a mistake. So we saw some variations in brain signals. So it needs to further uh, investigate how we can have this human in the loop in a way that the system can further improve over the time. The model, the user model that we have is a type of Bayesian model based on the previous behavior of model, but we can further expand it by including other aspects of the user in the model. And uh, this intelligent interaction between BCI and user model can further improve. It's really interesting to see how such a such an implicit control can be applied in other applications. Our scenario, it was a type of navigation application. So, uh, it's, it's interesting to see how it would work in other applications. So this is a work of two of my PhD students, Chris and Jake, so I thank them. And uh, before finishing the talk, uh, I would like to also mention that we have uh, Another research topic in Frontier is new ergonomic machine learning and signal processing for neurotechnologies and brain computer interactions out of the lab. So please uh, feel free to contact us if you would like to submit uh, your research in this research topic. Thank you so much for your attention and uh, please let me know if you have any questions. <laughs>